Hello and welcome to The Hated and the Dead with Tom Lehman. A very happy Jubilee weekend to all of you. I hope you enjoyed the long weekend. And this week, the subject of The Hated and the Dead is one of the Queen's elected Commonwealth representatives. Justin Trudeau has been Prime Minister of Canada since 2015, having served as leader of the governing Liberal Party since 2013. The son of former Liberal Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Justin led the Liberals to a landslide victory in 2015, after a decade of Conservative Party leadership. Whilst the Liberals are often seen as a party of the centre ground, some commentators have labelled much of the Trudeau government's social policy as radical and left-wing. Whilst these policies have proven controversial largely among Conservatives, what has attracted consternation from across the political spectrum is not the substance of many of Trudeau's social policies, but rather the manner of their delivery from the man at the top. Too often, Trudeau's personal governing style has appeared to be a mixture of media grandstanding and moralising, a toxic combination made worse by Trudeau's apparent failure to practice what he preaches, most famously on blackface, but also on sexual harassment. On the face of it, Trudeau might not appear as unpleasant as many of the other characters I have studied on this podcast, and that's because, to a great extent, he's not. He hasn't started wars that have killed thousands of innocent civilians, or shut down liberty and democracy in his country. However, politics is a comparative discipline, and in a relatively gentle political culture, Trudeau has been unusually controversial for a Canadian Prime Minister. And I wanted this conversation to be an attempt to uncover why. My guest for this conversation is Andrew Coyne, columnist at the Toronto-based Globe and Mail newspaper. We discuss the Trudeau political dynasty, the bipolar fortunes of the Liberal Party over the years, and Justin Trudeau's successes and failures as Canada's Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce Justin Trudeau. But first, I'd like to play you some promotion for Canadian podcaster Chris Baird. Have you ever wanted to learn about the man who tried to jump the St. Lawrence in a rocket car, the margarine bootleggers of Newfoundland, or the time the royal family had a barbecue with a regular Manitoba family in 1970? I explore all of those stories and more on my podcast, Canadian History X. Over the course of over 500 episodes, I've delved into the good, the bad, and the weird of Canadian history. From the days when the Vikings landed and met the indigenous to the Shawinigan handshake, I try and cover it all. What about politics? Well, on my podcast, From John to Justin, I look at our prime ministers, premiers, elections, opposition leaders, and governors general, and show how all of this shaped Canada to what it is today. On Canada's Great War, I delve into the First World War and how it completely changed Canada forever, beginning in 1914 and running until 1918. And lastly, if you want to learn about trains, then check out Coast to Coast, my look at the construction of Canada's transcontinental railway. All my podcasts are on all podcast platforms, ready to scratch whatever Canadian history itch you may have. Hi, Andrew. It's great to meet you. How are you? Good to be with you. Thank you. Andrew, we're talking about Justin Trudeau today. He's been the Prime Minister of your country, Canada, since 2015. He's quite young for a politician. He's, he's been PM for nearly seven years and he's only 50 now. Um, I suppose that before we jump into looking at Justin, we have to start by looking at another Trudeau, um, because Justin isn't the first Trudeau Prime Minister. Who is that other Trudeau? <laughs> That other Trudeau is his father, Pierre Trudeau, uh, who was prime minister from 1968 to 1984 with a brief interregnum when he was out of office for about nine months in between there, uh, who was a controversial figure, to say the least, uh, a person of some intellectual uh, heft. He'd been a professor of law, a noted um, um, antagonist of Quebec nationalists in the first flourishing of Quebec nationalism, or the first modern flourishing of it, uh, was somebody who was willing to take them on to make the case for Canada, to make the case for civil liberties, even if those were inconvenient to nationalist ambitions. Uh, so he was a, a, a remarkable figure, much loved, much hated, uh, uh, very imperious in his personal style, but 
uh, somebody who had to respect his his intellect and certainly his his passion for the country. The Trudeaus are members of the Liberal Party of Canada. Yeah. Just for the uninitiated, can you give a brief account of the party system in your country? Um, and no, it's, some of the some of the sort of similarities that it shares with my country's political system and some of the differences, so, you know, who are the liberals, who are their opposition, etc. Right. So it's a Westminster parliamentary system, but it's applied to a, a federal uh, system of government. First of all, that makes it different in some ways from the UK. And secondly, to a, a country with two official languages. Um, and that all adds some further complications. Um, it's sometimes been described as a one and a half party system of government in as much as historically uh, the liberals have been very much the dominant party. Um, they've won two and three, three and four elections uh, uh, historically. Uh, the conservatives, um, uh, formerly known as the progressive conservatives, uh, have been the main opposition party and they were the dominant party through the first few decades of our existence. They were the party of government when the country was founded. Uh, but ever since about... Uh, 1900 or 1920, certainly they've 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 had a rough go of things, um, and I think that's a crucial way to understand our our politics. First of all, in that w w when one party more or less assumes it will be in power, and the other party more or less assumes it won't be, or that it can only get into power by some stroke of luck or or whatever, uh, it it does bad things to your politics. It's it's much better if both major parties, if you have a two party system, if they both feel they can win or lose any given election. Uh, so if the besetting sin of the liberals historically has been a certain arrogance, uh, the besetting sin of the conservatives has been a certain insecurity and a, and a belief that the, everything's stacked against them and that the public doesn't like them and a sort of insecurity that, that really, I think, hurts them. Uh, we're not a two-party system, of course, uh, and part of our problem in this country is that we act as if we still think we have a two-party system. We did through the first 60 years of our existence, but we really haven't had a two-party system since about 1920. First of all, with the uh, what was called the Progressive Party, which was a kind of a populist party of mostly of farmers out west. And then laterally, since 1935, um, what is now called the New Democratic Party. Um, um, they're a social democratic party, um, you know, pretty similar to the Labour Party, maybe the Labour left. And those have been the three main parties for a long time. Recently, we've started to get even more parties entering the system. So we had the Green Party, as many countries around the world, uh, has broken through to the extent that they now have a couple of seats. Much more potently, the, the Bloc Québécois, which is the party of Quebec nationalists uh, who um, broke through. I don't need to get into all the details, but they've been a force since the 1990s. Um, and now we even have a, a, a populist, nationalist, Trumpian type party called the People's Party. So it's now at least a six-party system, uh, and yet, as I say, we still have a system that was more or less designed uh, for two parties, and which two parties are only – they're the only ones likely to form a government. In terms of the party that we're going to be talking mostly about today, the, the Liberals, would you essentially, given that they sound like a sort of party of, of, of power, um, would you basically put them in the political centre or leaning slightly more one way than the other? Yeah, left of center, and particularly, I think, and this is an issue in current Canadian politics, is under their current leadership, uh, they seem to have drifted a, a fair bit further to the left, particularly on um, social cultural issues. Um, uh, and there's a common feeling that that the, that the center ground is kind of between the liberals going in that direction, the conservatives having their own wanderings, that the center ground of Canadian politics has been a little bit deserted of late. Now, mind you, you know, the, the the center ground is always shifting, uh, and 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 it's the it's the it's in the capacity of adroit politicians to move the center to them. Uh, uh, but certainly, I would say historically, yes, the liberals have been uh, have been adroit at taking from the right or the left as circumstances dictated and as their need to stay in power dictated. Uh, I, I I certainly would say that the the most consistent description of the Liberal Party is a party of power. Uh, so they've been a little bit of a kind of a shape-shifting party, but with certainly in recent decades with, with a progressive edge to it. Uh, 
um, and and they they've been able to kind of straddle that center, but but pull it a bit to the left as time as time has gone on. Partly, as I say, by stealing policies from the New Democrats. But in the 1990s, when we had a terrible debt problem and we're near near the point where we couldn't sell our bonds and we had to make some pretty uh, tough um, uh, fiscal policy, pretty tough spending cuts, it was the liberals who did it. Uh, so to their credit, they're able to adapt to changing circumstances. Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's father, stopped being prime minister, as you said, in 1984. Um, Justin was 13 at the time. Through the rest of the 80s and 90s, when Justin Trudeau was growing up, um, what was he doing to kind of improve his political credentials? What what accounts do we have of his activities as a as a young man? Well, very little in terms of, of politics. Um, and I say this actually to his credit, uh, that, that for, for the first part of his life anyway, uh, he could have gone in one of two directions. He could have been an absolute wastrel and gone and, you know, done a lot of drugs in Saint-Tropez or something like that. And he didn't do that. Uh, and he could have just um, gone straight into politics at the age of 20 and capitalized on his family name. And he didn't do that either. He went off and he, you know, he taught high school and, and you know, studied various subjects. And, and he seemed to be pursuing his own course through life. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, I, I respect that, frankly. I think some people mock him for it. Um, but I think, you know, growing up in the shadow of his father, I mean, obviously it would come with some benefits, but it also comes with a great deal of cost in terms of expectations and feeling trapped in a certain life and, and people expecting you to do certain things and be certain things and live up to your father and all those things. So um, I, 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 I can only imagine that that was a, that was a, a difficult thing for him to deal with. But no, uh, up until relatively recently in his life, maybe it was always in the back of his mind. Maybe this was just, he was just playing the long games and not be suspected of, but I, 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 I think it's more likely that through the first part of his life, he was just um, pursuing his own course and, and, and trying to figure out life on this earth. Uh, and it's comparatively recently that he decided, first of all, to go into uh, politics and second of all, to uh, pursue the party leadership. Indeed, yeah. I mean, if we turn to discussing his political career a bit more closely, then he, he became a member of parliament at the 2008 election. Yeah. Um, and I think he became an MP at a time when the Liberals were in a real electoral downturn. Yes. They actually became, I, I didn't know this, but they became the third largest party in Canada for a time. You know, That's massively right. embarrassing considering the sort of, you know, electoral dominance that you've, that you've mentioned. Um, yeah. Why were the Liberals doing so badly at that point? Was it an image problem? Was it leadership? Was it ideology? Well, they had been in power for a long time uh, under Jean Chrétien and then Paul Martin, briefly under Paul Martin. And they had been in power, what, from 1993 uh, until, two, uh, when was it now, 2006. So partly you just acquire baggage as time goes on. Secondly, there had been a big schism within the party, uh, based mostly on the personal ambition of two men, but also with certain ideological and regional strands behind it, when that was Chrétien versus Martin. So Martin was kind of the Gordon Brown to Jean Chrétien's uh, 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 Tony Blair. He, he, was the, he was the doty finance minister who uh, conquered the deficit, or at least was given credit for it, uh, but was also very ambitious for the top job. And, 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 and Chrétien had, in fact, defeated him for the top job in the leadership race of 1990. So that, that tension was always there, that, that rivalry was always there. And over time... Uh, the ambition of Martin's people around him and, and Kretchen's mulish determination not to give in to them uh, it, it tore the party apart and to, to, to a great extent. Uh, thirdly, there was an enormous scandal, political scandal, as <laughs> periodically seems to visit the Liberal Party, uh, uh, over um, uh, spending in uh, advertising spending in Quebec, which was kind of funneled through various players and kicked back to the party. The, the details don't need to detain us now, but it was enormous uh, and had an enormous impact, and particularly in Quebec, uh, it, it really damaged the party's brand in a way that was very hard for them to to come back from. So once you're out of power, particularly if you're a party of power, uh, 
um, it, it can be quite devastating for you because how do you start to reassemble? If, if, if the basis of your of your support has been come along with us, we're inevitable, uh, and you can probably get good jobs in the government with us, and and these kinds of things. If that's what your argument for for being in power has become, then when you lose power, you lose a lot, and and so um, uh, so that is, is part of it. Um, I think the conservatives under Stephen Harper, um, who did a lot of things wrong, but also I think put together a fairly potent uh, and more durable coalition than the conservatives have been capable of in the past. And when when that party is doing well, everything the other party does, it, it just everything starts to feed in itself. You start to look weak. You start to thrash around trying to save yourself. And you elect leaders who aren't necessarily the leaders going to take you to the promised land. Again, that's to some extent a, a self-reinforcing loop. The, the leader will look a lot worse when the party is losing, even if it's not his fault. But there's no doubt they went through two or three leaders that just didn't seem to be able to 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 pull things together for them. So yes, by the by the time of uh, 2008 and 2011, even worse, they had some of their worst results in their history uh, in terms of the share of the popular vote and that kind of thing. Uh, and they were in a very bad way. Um, at the time, people like me were saying, well, this is an opportunity for the party to do a pretty deep rethink about what it means to be a liberal party in the 21st century, a, a centrist liberal party, um, start to think about, you know, what policy direction makes sense in, in this changed environment, all the sorts of things that people like me write. And the party took a long look at that and said, yeah, we'll just I think we'll just get Trudeau. So he, <laughs> he, he was he was a he was, a, you know, he had the potent family name. And one of the things that people like me always need to remind ourselves is politics can be very tribal uh, and it can be, in fact, monarchical. And this was the monarchical principle at work is that people were, uh, you know, if, if you've got the royal blood in you, people are going to look at you in a different way, fairly or unfairly, and not always to your benefit, but sometimes to your benefit. And, and, and there's some legitimacy to that in that being the son of a foreign prime minister gives you certain strengths and certain weaknesses. So the strength is he had a certain um, self-confidence to him that is gold in politics. People can sense if you're comfortable in your skin or not. And we generally, as voters, tend to run away from somebody who strikes us as needing the job too much or these kinds of things, if, if we think their psyche is overly invested in it. And he, at his best, had that kind of self-confidence. And what went with that self-confidence was a certain generosity, a certain mag magnanimity, uh, to others less fortunate himself, to his opponents. So he, he could sometimes strike a very good grace note uh, that I think a lot of that came from that, from where he came from. Uh, on the on the negative side, you know, he, he gave very little evidence of having really thought about um, any major issue very deeply. Uh, um, he certainly didn't represent any particular strand of opinion within the party other than you know, a, a certain inheritance of his father's, both his father's progress, progressiveness and his father's uh, willingness to, to to dig in against Quebec nationalists. Uh, uh, but we, you know, there was very little known about him, and what we did know wasn't terribly impressive. Uh, but he had that he had the family name, and and he had a certain celebrity quotient, and you know. It, it, wasn't to everybody's taste, but some people thought he was pretty good looking, and you know, all these things are that probably shouldn't be part of politics, but are. Um, and and uh, and as I say, he had a he had a certain uh, facility for politics. That is to say, he likes being around people. It, it's extraordinary how many people go into politics who are really fundamentally uncomfortable with yeah. the glad handing part of the trade, uh, and, and and look like they'd rather be anywhere else. Um, whereas Trudeau, I remember thinking this in the spring of uh, 2015. Um, there was a gay pride parade in, I forget which city it was. And the fact that it was gay pride parade is neither here nor there. But what was notable was he was bounding down the street, running from side to side to say hello to people in a most enthusiastic uh, way. And I remember looking at this and going, uh, boy, you know, I'm not sure the conservatives are ready for this. This is, this is, a, this is a guy who really likes people, likes politics, and, and that can be very potent in politics. I've often had cause to think i mean I, I wasn't around when tony blair was elected prime minister here in 1997 but the way that people 
the kind of warmth that people had for Trudeau when he got elected prime minister in 2015 seems reminiscent when I watch videos yeah. of, of Blair being reelected, you know, young, um, comfortable in his, own, in his own skin, almost a bit too comfortable at times. And, um, and after a period of kind of doer, uh, glowering conservative yeah. things, and you know, over time, I think conservatives get kind of depressed in power and, and uh, and uh, so, yeah, somebody, some yeah. bright young fellow comes along. And part of it also was, like Blair, uh, he, he at, at, at first seemed to promise some kind of a new synthesis, a, a, a less doctrinaire um, left approach to things, a mixture of right and left. You know, he, for example, he, he gave a speech in Calgary, I think it was, where he said, you know, I... I Words to the effect of, you know, I recognize that the national energy policy, which is a great bet noir and, and deservedly so in Canadian politics, a policy brought in by his father that basically attempted to insulate us from the world price of oil, which was foolish as an economic policy and certainly was devastating to the resource producing regions in, in, in Western Canada in particular. So for a Trudeau to come along and say, this was bad policy, I'm never going to do that again, uh, it, it kind of gave people some kind of signal that that maybe he was a more modern uh, um, type of liberal than, than, than the past. I, I think as time goes on, he's actually gone further left in other ways. Yes. Uh, yeah. But, but, uh, but at the time it, it, it seemed to suggest he, he was, he, there was some, something of interest there. I mean, he, he led the liberals to a, an amazing victory in 2015. They went from being, as I said, the third largest party to winning, yeah. to winning an overall majority in the house of commons in, in one election. This is, again, something that's often, you know, talked about about when Blair came in, in in Britain is how much of it can you attribute to a sort of powerful program and a powerful leader versus how much of it can you attribute to just people being sick of, of the party yeah. in power? It's a good question. I think I think it's a combination of things, not, not to dodge the question, but I do think it's a combination of the Harper government having won itself, having won a famous victory in 2011 where they seem to have built a very durable coalition, uh, which for a conservative party is unusual. Conservatives generally win in Canadian politics, either win massive majorities because the conservatives, the liberals have been in forever. People are so sick of them that they toss them all out at once. And they win these enormous majorities as they did in 1958 and 1984 that are inherently unstable because they're, they're, the tent is too broad and, and everyone thinks that the conservatives agree with them. And at some point, somebody has to be disappointed. So they either win that kind of victory or they win a narrow, squeaky minority. <laughs> but to, in 2011, the, the Harper government had, had built a kind of a look, looked like a pretty solid coalition between uh, the West and Ontario uh, that looked like it could last. And then they just frittered it all away over the succeeding years. Just again, we don't need to get into details, but they 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 seem to go out of their way to antagonize and alienate virtually everybody outside their 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 narrowest base. So it was certainly that was certainly part of it. I do think the Liberals had a bold uh, platform in 2015. Uh, some called it suicidal at the time, and I didn't. I don't. When I say bold, I don't say it necessarily agreed with a lot of it, but it was politically uh, quite effective. So in particular, uh, they after a long period of time in Canadian politics, when we we were all of us fiscal conservatives, because we'd had this searing near-death experience in the 90s. We Everybody agreed we should run balanced budgets and pay down debt and these kinds of things. And the Liberals, I think, correctly sensed that maybe that mood had started to shift. Uh, and so they ran on a platform unabashedly saying, we're going to run deficits. Now, they said at the time, there are going to be small deficits that will only be temporary and will be back to balanced budget in four years. But that all proved to be untrue. But but nevertheless, they 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 read the move correctly, correctly, and there were a lot of other things in the platform. It had a, it had a lot of heft to it. But if I had to put, and those were both contributing factors, but I think the the X factor was Trudeau. And the best thing, single thing I ever heard said about that election was a pollster friend of mine who said, um, he said, I don't think the Liberals would have won this if they hadn't started in third. So they started out the election. It was a very long election campaign, 10, 11 weeks, I think. Um, they started out back in third. They'd been in first at one point in the polls some months before, but they started the election campaign in third. And I filtered this through my discussion of the of the monarchical principle. And I really think, I mean, people tend to think in terms of stories. 
And I think a lot of voters were filtering that election through the lens of the Prince Hal story, right? The, the feckless youth who is tempered by adversity and grows up to become the king. And, you know, particularly when you've got the son of the former prime minister. So let me put it this way. Supposing the liberals had come into that campaign in first place in the polls, I think a certain proportion of the voters would have said, oh, you think you're entitled to this, do you? You think, you, you think you're think you born to this job. Well, let me s tell you some of the, you know, and they might have lost it. But because they came in in third and because he had to campaign hard for it through this long campaign and, and there was every opportunity for him to really mess it up. And he was certainly, you know, he was pretty unsteady when he started out, uh, but he got better as the campaign wore on and he managed to avoid blowing himself up. And I think by the end of that campaign, a critical mass of voters having looked at him and said, all right, let's give the kid a chance. Kid, you know, he's 43, but you know what I mean? Uh, and and um, so I, th and obviously having a solid platform helped relieve people's doubts about that and all these things contributed. But I, I, I think a lot of this was people just kind of looking at this guy and saying, am I willing to give, give him the keys to the car? Yes, I am. Enough voters said that. <laughs> this is a podcast about politicians that are controversial yeah. um, and if we look at what has happened over the course of of trudeau's premiership um certainly from i mean i'm saying this from some from the point of view of somebody that's looking at trudeau mostly through the angle of the british media system but a, an image that often comes across of trudeau in our media our kind of partisan media um, is that he's quite uh, patronising, sort yeah. of condescending. Oh yeah. Um, I... If obviously he's not the kind of he's not the first politician to be condescending or patronising, but fairly quickly after he became prime minister, his approval rating started to go south. Why do you think that happened? Yeah, I wouldn't overstate how quickly it was. He he had a couple of years there where he did quite he was he was pretty strong in the polls. But you're right that eventually it started to go south. Uh which of course is uh um, a cautionary tale for political parties that that when you win you know people fall out of love as quickly as they fall into it and when you win because of a certain infatuation of a certain section of the electorate uh you know then you got you got to be careful because eventually people will turn on you. So that's an overarching note. Um, I think it was accumulated things. It, it, he, um, you're absolutely right that part of it is it's a version of, of the age-old liberal arrogance in this country. Now, in previous incarnations, it was because we're the party of power. We can get away with stuff. What are you going to do about it? Uh, you know, we're, we're always going to be elected no matter what. So a certain arrogance that just goes with with that with that kind of thing. In Trudeau's case, it was a mixture of him being the son of the former prime minister and a certain arrogance comes with that, but more particularly with the kind of arrogance of virtue. And this is a very preachy government, uh, it, 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 particularly on social justice issues, identity politics issues. It's not to say that some of their um, the policies and, and stances that are not right. In fact, a lot of them are right, but they phrase it in a way that really makes it sound as if they are they regard anybody who doesn't think the same way as they do as being quite uh, beneath uh, their dignity to even respond to and so put together his own personal uh, style in that regard and the, the liberal party's habitual failure in that regard and this new kind of politics of woke virtue uh it, it, you know there's nothing wrong with being moral but being moralizing is 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 distasteful to people and and so it's it's the preachiness and as you say the condescension uh, that I think uh, is certainly one of the things and then mixed with hypocrisy because uh, you know as time has gone on we've learned more about some of his own personal foibles including being credibly accused of groping a, a young reporter um, some years ago uh, of of having uh, dressed in blackface uh, so many times he's not sure how many times. Uh, at an age when, and in a period when, you know, it's one thing to, to dredge up some film with somebody in the forties doing it, but, but he was doing it, you know, when he was, I think 29 years old, which is not that many years ago when anybody with any, uh, 
sense at all would know this is just really not on. So uh, um, I, I think that, that a sort of a grinding sense of hypocrisy, and I and and, and it, it, it 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 certainly is entirely possible that some of the liberal aggressive posturing on racial and gender issues was designed to protect him on this, that they knew they had these skeletons in the closet. They knew he was vulnerable and they decided the best defense was a good offense. I, I don't want to put it all down to that because I think there's a lot of true believers in the party, but I, I would not be surprised if that was part of the calculation of some of the people around him, that the way that we'll insulate ourselves from the attacks that we expect on these issues is we'll just, you know, paint the party as being sort of bulletproof on this. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the conservatives have sort of allowed them to get away with that to some extent. But anyway, yeah, that's, I think I think that's a big contributing factor. Uh, and, and, and closely aligned with that, a lot of ethics, ethical failings. There's been a series of, of ethical issues with the government, not the worst things you've ever heard of, but they kind of drip, 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 and particularly because they, in more, more cases, did not have involved personally the prime minister himself. If we sort of go back to the, the sort of social issues... Yeah. He's gained a, a reputation, and you you used it, and I I don't really like using it. I never I tried not I to, but 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 woke right I know. Um, I know. among among the sort of right wing in the English speaking world. He has that yeah. reputation, and I, I should say, you know, and you've already said it. You know, I'm very comfortable with expanding minority rights and and gender equality, kind of left wing social policy, as long as it comes with a degree of left wing economic policy as well trying to kind of better the economic situation of, of poor people. And I hear much less from Trudeau on those issues, things like income inequality, housing yeah. affordability. You know, I think you might know this term in Canada as well, but in British terms, he might be called a, a champagne socialist, a middle yeah. class person who kind of adopts socially liberal views to fit in with their friends. But actually, when it comes to left wing policies that might affect them, they're completely out yeah. to lunch. I mean, do you, um, do you think that describes Trudeau? I think that's a little over the top. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that they came into politics. They kind of borrowed an issue from the states, which was the stagnating middle class. Uh, you know, there was a lot of rhetoric and a lot of things put about it, but, you know, nobody's had a wage increase in 30 years in Canada. And it actually wasn't true. If you looked into the data, you know, we had a period in the 80s and 90s when wages went flat or down. And then ever since the mid-90s, they've been rising pretty steadily in Canada. So it's not the same story as the states. But because we're all watching American media, it's very easy to import these, these storylines. So they came into power saying, we're all about the middle class uh, and the, 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 the tedious liberal, tedious from repetition line is the middle class and those working hard to join it. And so they came in saying, we're going to bring in a... a, a a, a, a tax cut for the middle class and a tax increase on the upper classes. And neither of them amounted to a whole bunch. The, the middle class didn't do that better off. And the, the tax increase at the top wasn't that big a deal. Uh, but it was, it was great symbolism. So thus far, you could say, well, okay, champagne socialism or, or middle class phony, whatever you want to say. What I will say is this, the, the biggest single reform they brought in early on was a reform of the child benefit system that brought, brought to, it was textbook reform. They brought together a bunch of dis, different programs with different cutoffs and transition points, and which didn't work very well together, created all kinds of bad work incentives and didn't deliver enough aid to people at the bottom. And, and they basically reformed the design of that in a way that has absolutely measurably reduced the rate of poverty, particularly child poverty in this country. We now have, depending on how you measure, but by, by a lot of measures, the lowest rate of poverty in our history. And particularly child poverty. So on that thing, you got to you got to give that to them. That that was a genuine reform policy that I think incontrovertibly, uh, you know, it turns out you know give the poor more money, <laughs> they're less poor. Who knew? Uh, uh, so it, it, that that's really that, that I think that's their in my opinion is the single biggest, uh, in some ways simplest reform. But in some ways it was because you're just basically you know cutting checks. But it turns out that's one of the things government can do relatively well yeah, is, is cutting checks will. to people. It's not yeah. so good at managing big, complicated issues, but sending money out to people, it's, it's pretty good at. So, uh, yeah, so to thanks, and I think you have to – I would defend him against that charge. I, I, think, that, I think that's a major uh, uh, improvement in Canadian life for, for people at the, at the bottom of the income scale. 
Fair enough. That's that's quite interesting. It's not something that's that's filtered through. It doesn't get a lot of ink. I don't. I don't yeah, imagine. No, no. But no. but yeah. uh, but as I say, if you delve into the numbers, it's 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 basically incontrovertible. Well, of, well, I mean, often the the sort of the it, it's a shame, really, that the the kind of simplest reforms and the and you know the the dullest reforms, in a way, uh, don't really get any any yeah. headlines. But often they have the best effect. I mean, I want to I want to sort of turn to issues of kind of wider um, polarization in Canada. Um, if you look at the wider goings on in the Canadian political system over the last five or 10 years, it seems as if Canada has become more polarized between left and right. Um, obviously, it's not the only country that that's happened to. And again, as you said a second ago, it's important to sort of not uh, import American political trends to any other country, but particularly Canada, considering it's just next door. Um, but do you think that Trudeau's political style, this quite, as this quite sort of monarchic, fair, slightly detached way of doing politics, has made that polarization worse? To some extent, um, I wouldn't exaggerate the degree of polarization. So, um, you know, there's an old American line about, you know, politics being conducted between the 45 yard lines, if that means anything to a British uh, audience. Uh, that, that, that the divisions, you know, people that people are fighting about are not necessarily that large. Now, in America right now, they are. But in Canada, I still think it's mostly between the 40 yard lines, what shall we say? Um, so but I, I'm more encouraged than I am dismayed. There, there are some dismaying things happening in Canada. We're getting some of that same. Um, attack on expertise, attack on knowledge, the, the epistemic crisis that they talk about. Uh, that, that, that certainly is present in Canada, but not to the same extent as some other places. Uh, partly because we've been very fortunate. We haven't gone through the same series of traumas that the Americans have gone through in the last 20 years. We, you know, we didn't have anything like 9-11 here. We've had the odd terrorist attack, but nothing like 9-11. We went into Afghanistan, but we didn't get mired in Iraq we we you know we didn't have anything like the same financial crisis or the housing market collapse uh so you know we kind of skated through and I, I think partly because of that there hasn't been the same kind of discrediting of an entire class of experts and authorities it, it, again we import some of that but the broad mass of the public i don't think is is in that headspace and you can see it even as the conservative the conservatives right now are having a leadership race and it's pretty appalling on a lot of levels. There's a lot of stupid conspiracy theories being lifted, et cetera. But it's also interesting seeing the things that they're not doing. Nobody's going after immigration. Nobody's saying, uh, you know, we need to we need to just dismantle the healthcare system. I mean, the, the, for good or real, and I think those are both good things. They're 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 still pretty broadly in a in a in a they're somewhere in contact with the center ground. I, I think. I think they're not paying as much attention to it as they like, as, as I would like. I think the liberals are not paying as much attention as I would like, but I, at the same time, don't want to exaggerate that. But there's no doubt that there's a certain section of the public that is uh, furious with Trudeau. I think there's two groups that, that are disaffected. There, there are there are people who are just kind of tired of him and and think he's made a lot of silly policies and would like to have somebody a bit more sensible, center right. You know, there, there's a kind of a there's a kind of a center right voter who's been voting liberal because the conservatives they just they just don't look like they're ready to govern, but who would default back to the conservatives if if they were given any excuse if if the conservatives could put up any kind of credible vote. But so they've been parking their vote with the liberals. There's another type of right wing voter that thinks Trudeau is the antichrist, that that, that thinks he's a tyrant, that and a lot of this has been inflamed by the pandemic. Uh, uh, and and people and the response of governments and again the, a lot of this is found in a lot of countries of the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates and these things and people have persuaded themselves that these are terrible tyrannies and then on top if on top of that you've got a kind of a condescending guy who doesn't watch his mouth sometimes and says things that really betray that uh, and and make it seem like he's got no interest whatever in whatever anybody who opposes him thinks. Then that's going to inflame that as well. But so there's no doubt that he he has a personality type that tends to divide opinion. 
And if you then add to that this pressure cooker of the pandemic and everything related to that, it, it's, it's made it worse. But the hardcore Trudeau haters, I think, is, you know, five or 10 percent of the vote. So the, 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 real, the real haters, you know, if I mean, if you look at the policies that Trudeau supports, especially on the sort of social side, do you think that they have become more or less popular in the time that he's been in government? Um, that's an interesting question. So so one of their signature issues, of course, has been the environment and climate change. Yeah. And uh, some people think they haven't done enough on that. But I think broadly speaking, there, there's a certain I think the policy community thinks that they've done quite well on that. Uh, and they have done quite well politically because the conservatives had persuaded themselves and they had some reason to think this from past elections that they could always win elections by campaigning against the carbon tax, that, that people, people just hated carbon tax, hated anything to do with taxing. And, and any party that introduced it would be, it would be political suicide. Again, that, that term and uh, the liberals brought it in anyway and have won three elections. Uh, I wouldn't say they won them going away. They, they lost the popular vote, but they got enough vote in enough parts of the country, uh, in the right parts of the country, to be able to put together a, a, a governing coalition. Uh, and so um, uh, I think that, if anything, it's the conservatives now who have been left kind of offside with where the center of gravity of Canadian public opinion on that is. People, are, I, I, I grant that voters are a little can be a little bit hypocritical on this. They want something done about climate change, but they want somebody else to pay for it. But broadly speaking, the optics of of having a carbon tax versus not having one, even if your carbon tax isn't a very good one, you kind of have to have something like it now, I think, to, to have a chance of, of governing in Canada. So the, I don't think the conservatives have, have absorbed that yet because their base just hates it with a passion. And so they keep electing leaders who who promised to get rid of it and then discover ways not to get rid of it. And, you know, uh, um, but I think on that one, I think liberals have moved the needle uh, more in their direction. I think uh, similarly on indigenous issues, I think the public, it's kind of a similar to the evolution on racial issues in the States. The public opinion has kind of shifted where people are saying, okay, we, we just were not paying enough attention to this. We weren't, taking this issue nearly as seriously as we were, should have been. People have been suffering and dying. We really do need to, 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 to address this. Now, easier said than done because it's a really complicated issue to, to, to fix. But, 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 uh, but nevertheless, there's, I think, much more uh, of a political will in the general public, whether they'll make it their, you know, they're not going to vote on the basis of it, unfortunately, but, but it's definitely in their – in their uh, frame of reference more than it would have been in the past. And again, I think that's partly because the liberals have been, uh, have been uh, uh, championing it on some of the other stuff. I mean, you know, uh, every budget they, they is accompanied now by a 200 page um, gender analysis of it that in my experience, nobody pays more than two seconds attention to. So some of the more doctrinaire stuff um uh, I think it just kind of blows past people, and if anything, just irritates them. I don't think I don't think they've really uh, um, moved the needle on, on on some of the stuff, but it's important to their base and their activists uh, to do these kinds of things. And and uh, uh, but that that if anything, probably probably irrit in terms of their overall electoral balance, probably loses them more votes than it gains them. Because they're again, because they're so in your face about it and so preachy about it that uh, I think people would prefer you just sort of kind of got on with things and do whatever policy you think you want to do rather than sort of always kind of preening yourself in public about how how feminist you are, et cetera. Yeah, I mean it's a shame because that that sort of policy comes with or starts with the the best of intentions, but then perhaps yeah, becomes I, I indulgent it, it, or overzealous. I'm, I'm, some of those policies I agree with, some of them I don't. Yeah. Uh, but you can separate out the policy content from the 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 political results, and and you know I say this to people on the right as well. You know, you you could get a, you could you don't have to you know eliminate any distinction between yourselves and the liberals. You don't have to turn yourself into middle ground mush to get elected. But but people will give you a hearing if you come across like an adult and if you sound like you've thought your policies through. Uh, you know, I, I always say there's a difference between radicalism and extremism. You know. Medicare, which is beloved in this country, 
as the NHS is in Britain, was a radical idea when it first came along, right? Free trade, which is now the foundation of our prosperity, was a hugely radical and controversial idea when, when, it, when it came in. So there's nothing wrong with people having big ideas and wanting to make big changes. But you've got to persuade people that you've thought about this uh, and, and that you're open to evidence to the contrary and that you want to persuade people rather than just yelling at them and all these things. And the conservatives don't seem to be able to wrap their minds around that. They, 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 they think that the two alternatives are either you just turn yourself into the Liberal Party light or you just go out of your way to try to antagonize and piss off liberals, you know, the, the owning the libs thing which is unfortunately seems to be the marker now of your conservative conservative virtue. It's, it's the conservative version of virtue signaling. It's just to be as asinine and, and antagonistic and anti-everything as you possibly can. This, this proves you're, you're a fighter, you know? Yeah, you're just, you're either the Liberal Party or, or the Tea Party, yeah. right? So I, I would like to see a conservative party that was more substantively different than liberals, had, had substantive policy alternatives for good or ill, but also came across as nice people you, you might want to have a beer with, you know, and then <laughs> apparently that's asking too much. <laughs> Trudeau's won three elections as liberal leader, um, but he's only won the popular vote once in the first okay. election in 2015, the second two elections. Um, the conservatives have actually got more votes. So that's because of the, the first past the post electoral system, which we that's also right. have in Britain. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, in Britain, the Conservative Party are the kind of defenders of first past the post. Yeah. Now, whether that's because they are just more small C conservative and don't like changing things or because it benefits them the most, um, it's not entirely clear. It's probably a bit of both. But how much dissatisfaction with the electoral system is there in Canada? I think there's a fair bit um, and it bubbles up from time to time. You know, without getting into an hour-long discussion of electoral reform, you know, there's, there's there's many reasons why one might favor moving to a more proportional system. But it's particularly uh, germane, I think, in a country like Canada that's so regionally um, diverse because the effect of it has been to reward and encourage regional-based politics in a country that needs a national vision. But we don't, frankly, have any national party. The Liberals like to think of themselves there, but they're not. They haven't. Last time the Liberals won a majority of the seats in Western Canada was 1949. Uh, so the Liberals are basically the party of, of you know, Central Canada and, and, and the coasts. And the, the Conservatives are the party of Western Canada and a bit of Ontario uh, and, and sometimes a bit of Atlantic Canada. And, and, you know, the Bloc takes a certain number of seats in Quebec and, and, and first past the post rewards parties that can clump their vote geographically. So it, it basically takes all our existing divisions, which are real enough on regional grounds, and pours salt in them, makes it worse. Um, the Liberal Party, uh, uh, as you may know, ran in 2015 on a very explicit, bold letter promise that this would be the last election held under first past the post partly because they had an activist base, some sections of which genuinely believed in it, but also because they were they were in the perennial liberal uh, strategy, which is to steal votes of the NDP. And, and one way you do that is by emphasizing how scary the Tories are. And so therefore, if you were even thinking about voting New Democrat, you can't because you have to vote liberal to keep the Tories out. But they added to it in this in that campaign some policies that were designed to say to people, we're not your father's liberal party or my father's liberal party. Uh, we, we, we get some of these issues that are near and dear to the New Democratic Party, including electoral reform. So they ran a very explicit promise to, to, to reform the existing system. They didn't say how they would reform it. And in the end, after having held some public hearings, Trudeau found an excuse to, to toss the whole thing out, and they basically just reneged on the promise. The Liberals certainly, if any party has benefited from the status quo, it's the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party has won, as I say, I forget it. I think it's two elections and three over the last hundred years, 120 years. Uh, the, and so you can see why they don't really have any interest in changing the existing system. The, the only reform they would probably go for would be ranked ballots uh, because they would probably get second, third choices, and that would be in their political interest. But a proportional system, they're not going to go for. The conservatives, I think, again, partly, as you say, out of just kind of knee jerk this is the part this is the system that we were founded on why would we ever want to change and partly out of perceived self-interest <coughs> have been hostile to it 
But I would argue it's actually probably, I don't think it is in there against their self-interest to reform. First of all, they haven't done very well under the existing system. It's not like they're, they've had a sterling track record. But also, I would argue the presence of there being essentially two left-of-center parties and one right-of-center party, you would think would mean the left-of-center parties would be, would be out of power. But what's happened is when you have more than one party, it, it, it doesn't just share the voting pool. It expands it. And part of that is in any given debate in Canadian politics between those three parties, it's always the conservatives who look like the odd man out. Like the, the between them, the liberals and the NDP can say, well, we're the we're what represents the consensus of reasonable people. Why can't you people get on side with this? And if you're always the third part, you know, you're just at a disadvantage. But secondly, those the people sometimes think you can just add the liberals and the NDP together and, and it equals some voting pool. No, they have distinct they have distinct uh, uh, constituencies. If if you merge the two parties, their their support base would probably shrink. There's some people who vote NDP who would never think of voting liberal and and and, and vice versa. I think if you had a sensible uh, second conservative party in in the mix, like a like a German free democrat type party, you know, a, a free market type party, I think that could expand the base of voters. It, it could actually make the, make the make more of a level playing field between the left of center parties and the right of center parties. Unfortunately, we now have another right of center party, but it's it's a very conspiratorial, Trumpian, um, not a, not a sensible, not a serious party, frankly. Uh, so that we're not going to be able to run it. But if, you know, if you go back to the period when the conservative vote was was split in the 1990s between the Reform Party, as it was called, and the Conservatives, uh, um, their combined share of the vote was larger than the Conservative Party, the Unified Conservative Party, has got since then. So all this is to say. Uh, I think some conservatives increasingly are starting to think about this, that this is actually might not be against their interests and might actually open up some intriguing possibilities for them. It would help them break out of their Western power base, which has been a, you know, they own the West, but they've had a tough time breaking into Ontario and Quebec and, and Atlantic Canada. And, and if you had a more proportional system, they'd have a better shot at it, I think. Trudeau has been prime minister for six and a half years now, Andrew. How long has he got left, do you think? Uh, the conventional wisdom, which I think is probably true, is uh, probably only a couple of years. So the last couple of elections, as you mentioned, they, they were defeated in the popular vote. Uh, he, he ran behind the party, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of his popular approval. Uh, so where once he was there, absolutely their biggest asset, uh, he, he isn't anymore. It's not saying he won't ever be, but if you had to guess right now, he, he, so, and, and indeed they've, they've finished behind the Tories in the popular vote in six of the last seven elections, I think. Uh, so I think that after this last election, which was, you know, called for no apparent reason, you know, in defiance of a, ostensibly a fixed election date law, uh, without any overriding issue, and where they all of the parties ended up with, within a, a seat of where they were before the election and within a percentage point in the popular vote. It was almost as if the election never happened. At the end of that election, my sense, for what it's worth, of, of liberal opinion was uh, he, he can stay as long as he doesn't stay too long. As as we don't want to run the next election with him as leader. So we're not going to kick him out right now, but we're hoping he'll make a graceful exit in the next couple of years. Um, whether he will or not is another question because uh, typically party leaders tend to stay one election too long. You know, they, they, they convince themselves or they have people around them who convince them that they're the indispensable one and they just hang on that. You know, the, the, the number of, at least in our country, the number of political party leaders who go out on top <laughs> is not, <laughs> not, not, uh, not many. Uh, all too often they, they, uh, they, so I think that would be the fear amongst some liberals is that, that he'll overstay as well. Now, some of that will depend upon what happens with the Conservative Party. You know, if, if they elect uh, Pierre Poilievre, the leader, who is leading, a, I would, it's not a Trumpian thing, but it's certainly a very populist uh, type of message. Uh, I think there's a lot of Conservatives who are worried that that will um, make them unelectable, and it may affect the liberal calculation in terms of whether they're willing to change leaders or not. But, 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 Leaving the leaving that aside, I think the mood of the party would be, um, uh, what's that? The, the line people say is, uh, 
when you when you know you're really about to about to be kicked out is when people say he's earned the right to make his own decision. <laughs> That's when you know you're at death's door. And so when we hear people in the Liberal Party saying, Justin Trudeau has earned the right to make his own decision about when he wants to go, that will be the time for him to go. Well, there's a there's a similar one in, in footballing speak in the UK. Yes. You've obviously got the manager of a football team, like the coach, and then you have the board of directors and the, the owners of the club. And whenever it says on the news that... Um, I don't know, let's say Jose Mourinho, football manager, Jose Mourinho's and you know, he, he has the full backing of the board, you know, he's about to get there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. In British politics, there's a kind of um, trope of, we have like a, an interesting prime minister and then we have a dull one. We had Tony Blair and then we had Gordon Brown and we had uh, Theresa May and now we have Boris Johnson. Do you think that, Stylistically, the next liberal leader will be a sort of real departure from Trudeau. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, d- d- depending on where they're at in the polls. Um, you know, if you it, it, if you were really heading for defeat, then you'd want somebody, you know, as clearly different as you possibly could. And that would argue against some of the people who are considered front runners now, notably Christopher Freeland, the finance minister and, and deputy prime minister. Um uh but um but she in herself is even though she's closely associated with him uh, i think is viewed as being a bit more sort of down to earth a bit more substantive uh I'm not sure i totally think that's merited but that <laughs> is more of her reputation um so i i i i would imagine there will be a sense that we want somebody we 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 we've, we've done the celebrity thing we've done the high flying Globe trotting, you know, photo op type of person, and people got tired of that, you know, before too too long, and it's it's been a drag anchor on them ever since. You know, there, there was the maybe the probably the low low water mark for him was the infamous trip to India. I don't know if your listeners will be familiar, mm-hmm. but he made a, a visit to India where he sort of went to a playbook that had worked from the past of him kind of dressing up and 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 trying to be like his like his, his hosts and everybody in India from where, from where I could tell cringed at it. And, and certainly people in Canada cringed at, you know, these endless photo ops with him apparently thinking it was a Indian prince, you know, uh, um, it, it, it wore, it, it, he looked pretty foolish and got, you know, obviously was getting very bad, bad advice on that. Um, so yeah, I would think, uh, I would think uh, 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 at least among liberal party people, there will be a feeling of we need to, we need somebody who can shore up his perceived weaknesses. I, I, I mean, I was sort of thinking <laughs> during this conversation, just to bring this to an end, I do episodes of this show on people, uh, you know, on, uh, on real sort of, you know, dictators. And I was sort of, and I've just been thinking, if if the worst thing you can say about your leader is that he's a bit annoying, I don't think right. that's too bad. Yeah, I, as as I say, there there have been people who've been attempting to sort of conjure him up into this terrible tyrant, an enemy of freedom. Now, you know, I would say that he has some abuses of power to his name. Uh, notably, there was an attempt to interfere with a criminal prosecution. That was that was a, that was a pretty serious matter, but it was pretty garden variety compared to genuine tyrants around the world so no that that's pretty silly uh um yeah mostly i think the knock on him is is yeah he's annoying uh he's tiresome he's full of himself he 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 and his party tend the the present party there's this feeling that they're they're a bit superficial they're very enamored of themselves and very enamored of symbolism and 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 feel-good displays at the expense too often of substance and 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 and, and real achievement, um, uh, but as you say, if if you know if that's the worst that we're dealing with as a country, then we're we're a pretty fortunate country, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, thank you very much. That was great. Um, thank you. Enjoy if that. if um, people want to uh, you know listen to to more of your stuff or read more of your stuff, uh, where can they go? Uh, I write a column for the Globe and Mail newspaper in Canada, so the the Globe and Mail dot com. Uh, and I'll be there somewhere on the opinion pages. Thank you, Andrew. Cheers. Okay. Thank you for listening to The Hated and the Dead. If you've enjoyed this podcast, follow it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, 
and, for good measure, leave us a review. You can also follow The Hated and the Dead on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook so you never miss new content.